Yeah, yeah. So my eyes are tracking the movement. Oh, hello, hello, hello. We're here. Hi, everybody. So should we give people a minute or two? Yeah. To log in? Yeah. That, yeah. I love to put people on the spot and ask them if they have any jokes. So we're doing this on Italian time, not on German time? On Italian time. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, so Germans are like, you know, it, it start at 8 o'clock, we're going to be starting at 8 o'clock. Yeah. And yeah. it's Italian time, 8, 10, 8, 15. <laughs> well, we, we like to give people about two minutes. So if you're watching this uh, later on, fast forward about two minutes. <laughs> just to give people a chance to log on. We never know how many people will join us live. Sometimes it's quite a lot of people, and sometimes it's just one or two, and yeah. however it goes is how it goes, you yeah. know? Uh, so, you got a joke? Oh my gosh, I have funny stories. Less okay. Less jokes, but funny stories. Okay. So, uh, when I was in high school, uh, and I love telling this story because, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. I was in high school, and it was an inner city school, and I walked out one day at the end of the school day, and I found a dead skunk up by the curb of, yeah. of the, the drive. And I thought, you know what? One of my favorite science teachers would love to see this because yeah. it's an excellent example of decom. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> of decom. I was, I know, my grandfather was, was that way. He'd oh, like get yeah, dead yeah. things and Let's then, go get yeah, it. I know, science. And so, yeah. but I figured, I'm like, no way is she going to want to go all the way outside to go get it. So I yeah. have to take it to her. So I went and I found a box and I was really careful not to touch the skunk. The dead skunk. And I got scooped it into the box and I took it to the science teacher and I remember her saying like, what you got there, Elspeth? And in the back of my head, a little part of me was like, this is a terrible idea. And I was like, shh, we're committed. <laughs> <laughs> shh, 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 shh. No, 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 okay. it's too yeah. late. It's too late. You yeah. have to be with me on this. And so, uh, and so the words out of my mouth were, a dead skunk and it was at the shared teacher's office so there was a teacher sort of another one of the stragglers who hadn't quite gone home yet and his words were oh god and he tried to open the windows but the inner city school windows didn't open that far so it was yeah. like and, and i had this box with a with a dead skunk and i thought this was a fantastic idea yeah yeah and uh i was she she was very very nice about it and very calm about it and our lesson for that day was why we don't handle dead animals mm -hmm. and I had to be very careful not to be like no I didn't touch it I didn't I was very careful and maybe <laughs> dead skunks in dead particular good might be fascinating but revolting at the same time I try you try so therefore no one should judge me don't judge don't judge me for being curious <laughs> no it was a gift I didn't understand that dead animals were yeah. a cat yes oh, yeah, no. yeah. well my grandfather was a um, Fantastic. science teacher and for him it was all great like we would go muck around in the swamp and look at how larvae and mosquitoes and it was cool and it was fun and dead things he would Find them and then and then put them in I don't know some kind of chemical to make it all dissolve and we'd examine the skeleton and the teeth yeah. and the bones and then, you know he's the a dead animal did he rub up against your legs <laughs> no my grandfather <laughs> <laughs> all right, should we start sure okay so we have one person watching hello whoever you are I hope that you can hear us all right uh, we'd love a an amen or a thumbs up if just to make sure that you can um, and uh, let's get started we. Think that people will probably join us as we're chatting and uh, I've got a little preamble here that I'm gonna read and we'll get going so hello my name is Karen Boyty I am a <coughs> member of the board of directors of the Ontario Autism Coalition we are parents people on the autism spectrum therapists and teachers and kids kids too uh, we're family we, the Ontario Autism Coalition, are a non-partisan political organization. Our aim is to help slash insist that governments provide meaningful supports for people in the autism spectrum. Until now, our Facebook Live chats have been attempts to reach out to the community and help people navigate the system. It's an opportunity for our members to speak directly to our expert advocates. But tonight, tonight, we're doing something a little bit different. Tonight, we bring you the amazing 
What's your name? Oh, sorry. I thought it was Who the heck you. are you? <laughs> I'm Elspeth Dodman. Elspeth Dodman. And the incredible Laura Nadine. Laura Nadine. <laughs> incredible <laughs> Laura Nadine. Two amazing women, friends of mine. They are also accomplished artists, writers, and superb advocates. They are also grown ups who happen to be on the autism spectrum. Uh, <laughs> yes, you're grown up. You are a grown up. Sorry to hate. Don't tell. Sorry to break it to you. It's a lie. So tonight, Laura and Elsbeth have agreed to join me and talk about their lives. I want to thank you. Thank you for your generosity tonight. Uh, we're going deep tonight, gang. Note, please, that the OAC is cur currently focusing on the election coming up this June, and our focus right now is education issues. But tonight, uh, it may include politics, it may not. We're going to talk about a lot of things, and Laura and Elspeth have agreed to share personal stories about their lives. We're family. We want people to thrive, not just survive. That's the theme tonight. Okay, so I have a question from Laura. Hello, anybody that's out there. Can you hear us okay? If we could give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, we'd appreciate that. I have a great question from Laura starting out tonight. What's your favorite thing about being autistic? My favorite thing about being autistic, let's see, um, I'm not normal? <laughs> no. um, okay, I'll be more elaborate. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, as somebody that was diagnosed in late life, I kind of got a chance to wear autism without the name or the label, so I just get to be me. Yeah. And I really got branded as me. I'm known as Little Laura. And I'm a lot like my grandfather. And one of the things that people tend to call on me for uh, when they need my help is that I can be very analytical. I can problem solve really well. I'm good at um, handling an urgent situation in the moment. So I'm, yeah. I'm the call to person. Just, just don't call me a week later. Uh, <laughs> I'm great yeah. in the moment yeah. doing that kind of stuff. But... I also have a unique way of looking at things. So a lot of times when people couldn't figure out what it is that they want to do about something, I would be the one that they call in to get the unique view. As young as seven, eight, nine years old, you know, as a young child, yeah. I remember my neighborhood friends knocking on the door. And I opened the door to a chorus of children arguing with each other. And they'd come to me to have me help them settle their argument. So I think the thing I like the most about being autistic is that it gives me this unique point of view on things that others haven't had yeah it kind of an opens up and enlightens life for others you said the first thing you said to me was I'm not normal what what is normal what does nor that word mean to you normal to me means drone um, you know stamped cookie cutter have to fit into whatever the societal expectations are of the day so yeah. you're you're not gonna see me if I were born in the Victorian era you wouldn't see me in sitting in a parlor, you know, sipping tea and talking about, I think Darwin. I don't say parlor is sipping tea. No, well, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I was saying that what, I'm not into social constructs for the sake of, um, what do you call it, uh, chit chat, small talk kind of things. It's, I, I don't do what's expected of me when you look at me. Yeah. I think that's probably a better definition of normal. Yeah. You have a, a preset societal expectation of what a female of my age should know or should not know or be able to do and I, I don't fit that. Are other people's expectations important to you? No, unless they get in my way. Okay. So um, one of the things that's difficult is that if somebody is in a position of power yeah, and they use that position of power to make me look less powerful and they start putting things in my way to make it difficult for me to help myself or get where I want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, then yes, I care what that person thinks because I either need to settle something with them or move them out of my way or get around them. Mm -hmm. and I need information to do that. Yeah. So when I say care about what they think, I mean it more as a functional level, not as an emotional support level. Right. There's a handful, I can count people on one hand that I actually care about what they think of me as a person. Yeah. yeah. And two of them are my own children. Yes. <laughs> Elspeth. Hello. Hey. <laughs> So I want to ask you the same question. What is your favorite thing about being autistic? The uh, positive sensory stuff. Um, there's a lot of negative sensory stuff in, in my life, uh, okay. but there's also a lot of positive stuff. 
when you find a song, when you find music and you get those two perfect bars and you chase after it and you can feel it and you feel the color of the music and you feel how that sounds and it, you let the music drag you along and you're having this great experience with that. Uh, the feeling of, of um, chewing on the hem of your shirt, uh, you know, as, as you're listening to music, the texture of, of things around you, uh, the feel of a weighted blanket, the, you know, the sensory is so great. You get to, get to see a dog and be that happy that you saw a dog today. I saw a dog today. It's a German yeah. Shepherd. She was very lovely. She was expecting hot dogs, and, but she uh, she let me pet her, and she was, you know, she was great. And so I'll, I'll often echo it that, you know, I saw a dog today, and my mom's like, yes, good yeah, for you. Yes, yes, yeah. again, you saw a dog. Yeah. Uh, but if I tell you enough times that I saw a dog today, will you will you feel that excitement with yeah. me? Will you be yeah. that happy yeah. that you saw a dog today? Um, I think it's also uh, the the skills that it allows me to have. So I, I worked at uh, chapters for a little bit. I worked uh, at five in the morning, unpacking boxes and putting stuff on the shelves. Yeah. Um, and because books are very visual because of the covers, uh, I I didn't need to use the scanners as often as as my coworkers. I would look at the picture and say, I've seen this picture before. Where? And immediately I could just shelve it yeah because I'd seen that picture you know I'd shelved 15 dogs a copy of 15 more dogs yeah <laughs> more dogs. I, I shelved I the book 15 dogs yeah we shelved that book so many times that just by the time you know oh, it's more 15 dogs there you go but uh, I was faster than my co-workers yeah um, and and now uh, that I work at a comic book shop it's allowed me to use my special interest to say actually Thor the comic starts in the hundreds because uh, he originally started in Journey into Mystery. So really, we need to start sorting Journey into Mystery. If you get in the hundreds of Thor, you're at the beginning. Uh, Captain America uh, started, but then uh, merged a little bit uh, with one of the other comics, uh, Tales of Suspense, at the hundredth issue. And so we need to remember that the hundredth issue there is also technically the hundredth issue of Tales of Suspense. You know, so it's it allows that special interest yeah. to get you into a niche job where you can really be very useful and helpful and I mean there's there's nothing like it when you have all that information and, and you're actually able to use it for something yeah. and, and be able to talk about it and enjoy it. I, I know for myself paying attention to that much detail overwhelms me. <laughs> it can at times yeah. um, but when you when you get that sort of single focus when you get that single it, it just clicks and stays and yeah. and it's sort of effortless uh, when things that I I don't care about or go into the useless pile like how do you get to Dundas and Boy? like how do you yeah. get to you know yeah. where, what street are you on I don't know. Uh, uh, there's yeah. a dog over there yeah uh, it's a did you see the dog yeah, did you see the dog it's a great dog it's a Doberman Pinscher yeah. now Doberman Pinschers were bred as German tax collecting dogs yeah. way back to help protect Mr. Doberman who was tax collecting in a very seedy part of town and wanted protection because he didn't want to be handling money all by himself. You know, where are you though, Elspeth? <laughs> so, <laughs> when you're recalling these details, but like you can it, it, it just it's Yeah, with the comic books and stuff like that, does d does an image come to your brain? A little bit, yeah. Um, yeah. Like what 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 happens when you're sifting through and somebody says, I need the Hercules comics from the 1960s, oh I don't gosh, remember the Hercules. edition. You know, like um, what happens? It is very much like having your own Google search engine in your head. Yeah. So um, for for comics, again, it, it was recalling a picture. Yeah. So if the boss said, I want uh, this certain issue number, uh, for X Men, and I need I want you to pull all of them and set them aside separate because they're of more value, and we will sell them at a higher rate yeah. than the other ones. We can't put them yeah. in the dollar ninety nine bin. Uh, I don't remember the number. I remember the picture on the cover. Yeah. So anytime that picture comes back, I'm pulling it, and uh, so it's it's not a number recall right. because numbers are are too numbers aren't aren't my sandbox. They're not my jam. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of like individual pictures for each number that you have to remember. Right. But if you can remember the cover 
of that comic. You can, yeah. you know, you can grab it. And so your, you know, your precision is a lot, it is, is pretty strong because it's just a recall of, of an image. Laura, do you have a similar talent? I, you're a musician. Uh, and uh, I know a little bit about your musicianship. Uh, do you have a do you have a similar talent that that is um, <coughs> that you can you can share? Yeah, mine's not verbal, so um, yeah. I can't give you a catalog of every piece of music I can play verbally. But you play the first two notes, and I can play all of it. So it just comes. It just it's all there. I can hear all of it in my head, not right. just my part, but everyone else's part too. So I yeah. know all the accompaniments and and second violin parts, and and I can replay the whole thing in my head like a radio. So if I was to say, can I quiz you? If I was to say, play the second violin part for the Brandenburg Concerto, the first movement, could you remember? <laughs> you pick one. You pick one. <laughs> the, the, the second violin part for second. Brandenburg number five. Number five. Wow. So, um, Elspeth, you've got a fidgety sort of toy yeah. there. I got a fuss. You got a fuss. I had a fuss because I'm excited. You're excited. <laughs> um, yeah, keeps my hand still. Uh, when I was in school, I uh, it was the expectation was that you sat still. Yeah, you will sit still. Right. The the bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you uh, you are expected to sit still, and you'll do that. And mm -hmm. and uh, oftentimes there really wasn't an understanding of when the class would end. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point in my life, I didn't have a really good grasp on that. Mm -hmm. When will it end? When can I not sit still? And uh, my sit, my staying power wasn't as good. And so, uh, in order to uh, to get myself to do that, to to make myself sit still, because we we reach a point where I'd start burning out, right? You know, but I knew you have to sit still. You can't get up. You can't. You can't go, and I mean, sometimes I see I see my friends on the spectrum who do just get up and go, and I envy them that freedom to yeah to just get up and go when they want to yeah. because you know you're sitting there and you get to the point where you're you're starting to burn out yeah and um, a kind of liberation right yeah like I know oh, I'm not yeah. supposed to but I'm breaking free yeah I'm gonna go yeah. I'm gonna go and yeah. I don't care yeah. and and you know you sort of want that for yourself a little bit but you understand what the expectations are right. these are the rules. Right you will sit still and you will listen. And um, when I was in elementary school, because I didn't know I was on the autism spectrum, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 14, mm -hmm. the word autism had been tossed around, but at that time in the 90s, it yeah. wasn't like it is today. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, were, they thought about it, but so, um, so because I didn't have a diagnosis to say this is what I need or explain why things were the way they were, uh, I made up my own routines, whether it was stealing sticky tack from, from the walls of the school to, mm -hmm. to fuss with or play with. Um, yeah. But that, that gets stale after a while. That doesn't, that doesn't work forever. Yeah. And uh, eventually I started picking the skin around my fingers until I didn't have fingerprints anymore. And uh, on four separate occasions, I tore out uh, teeth. You so tore I, out your teeth? I tore out my teeth. Uh, they were baby teeth, so they were coming out anyway. <laughs> but uh, they weren't loose when I started, and they were out by the end of the day. So you sat in your chair in order to keep yourself steady and still, like you're supposed to, be a good girl. Yeah. You put your hand in your mouth, and you worked yeah. on the tooth. back of your yeah. tooth until it came out. Yep. Yep. So it started bleeding until the tooth came out. That's quite a lot of... That's quite a lot of discipline. It's, it was an understanding of where the rules were, and it was an understanding of needing to follow rules, but to a point of leading into self harm. Yeah. And um, and so sometimes you know when I when I see people who, like friends of mine who yeah. don't sit still, who just get up and they go and they come back whenever they feel like it. Right. There's sort of an envy of, not that they. Not that they're at a place where they don't care about the rules, but that they just don't know that they're there, or that they have enough self awareness to say, "This is what I need." Yeah. I know that uh, that it is much more healthy for me to get up, go for a walk, come back when 
uh, when I am feeling better, when I'm able to, and I can, you know, uh, to be able to advocate for themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what bothered me about, about school at that time was that no one tried to stop me either. Like no one in the school mm -hmm. said, there's a child. Is she take what? Like yeah. no one, no one, no one jumped in on this and was like, "There's an issue." Yeah. When I when I got to high school, um, I had a very very nice receptionist who I would go in and say, "I I just need a band aid to wrap my hand in, like to my fingers, yeah. to keep me off my fingers." Yeah, and I mean she she made it her life mission yeah. to give me enough band aids. And to be checking my fingers, to be asking me if she saw me how I was doing, to be praising me when when the skin was growing back. Yeah, uh, it was a different level of care. Was that was that rare for an adult to peer yes. into your life and ask you why, for example, you might be doing like why would you be picking the skin away from your fingers so that your fingernails are the nerves are exposed in your hands and removing your own teeth in elementary yes i had one ea who was an angel yeah she was a patient and a dear woman and i can't say enough nice things about her but she was a part-time ea in a school of 200 kids right and so you know you'd see her when you see her and yeah. and that wasn't that wasn't on her that was the system that you know we we just we didn't have the staff yeah and we didn't have the resources and we didn't know what we were doing right. and there wasn't a diagnosis to be had and the IEP was followed if somebody thought about it maybe yeah. and let me ask you you know how old were you when you were diagnosed so when you got that oh, piece of paper 14. 14 you were 14 years old so 14. you went through all, public school yep all the way to it was grade nine. high school the dirt hit the fan and they finally said that's autism because right. at six years old they sat down and said this looks like autism but we're not sure mm -hmm. she's she talks too much she's too chatty she's too chatty she's a girl she's we a want girl. rain man we're looking for we're looking for rain man so and i look nothing like Dustin that's Hoffman. right so when somebody threw a bunch of matchsticks on the floor and i couldn't and you count couldn't it. instantly know <laughs> they were like there was yeah. 42 not that there, one. yeah <laughs> you don't qualify yeah nope too talkative nope nope too chatty nope 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 and asperger's at that time level one autism now um was only just recognized under the dsm the mm -hmm. uh the big medical book in the sky uh, as I like what does DSM it? stand for? Oh gosh, the diagnostic statistics uh, manual. Um, Did everybody hear on, that? We're on five right, now. We're, on five. we're gonna yeah. have to make you speak louder just to make sure people uh, hear you. The well, it's the, it's the big giant book that psychiatrists and psychologists use in order to have um, a system at being able to diagnose somebody, right? So they have categories of behaviors for the I'm just using their, their words. Yeah. And the categories of behaviors, and you have to exhibit so many of each characteristics in so many categories right. to qualify for the diagnosis. Yep. So it's 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 a manual that tells psychiatrists what to look for. Yeah. Right. Um, it's highly controversial among some groups. I mean, but among others, you, you have to have some standard. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, that person, you know, doesn't have any social skills. They're autistic. It, it's not quite that light. Yeah. I'd like to, um, can I, if I can, add a little bit to the school talk. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things that happens, especially with girls on the spectrum in school, is that uh, we don't usually exhibit behaviors outwardly. It's, it's not as common. Right. So as long as we're sitting in the back of the classroom, she could be t picking her hands apart. Nobody cares because it's not interfering with the rest of the class. So that, that obedience is really what saves you. Yeah. So I was very obedient in school. I listened to my teachers. I did what I was supposed to. I was a mess inside, yeah. uh, as I wasn't diagnosed until I was 26. So I went all the way through school, dropping out of high school, uh, grade 10, yeah. um, trying to figure out how to do all this on my own. Uh, I was dyslexic. There's a couple of things that I had trouble with. Uh, um, and so I think because I didn't cause trouble for the rest of the class, mm -hmm. that was when I didn't, I, I wasn't an issue. It's when I started arguing with the teachers pointing out things that they were doing wrong, or, you know, because teachers love that. 
um, <laughs> that I would end up in trouble. But yeah. they also didn't like my mom real well. So, you know, they was like, deal with the kid, deal with the mom. So and on that case, yeah. I had a mom that would come down and say, what's going on? And yeah. yell at them. And they yeah. would rather deal with me. But anyway, I, I think that's what happens to a lot of us. So she was saying no one came in to interfere or help her. And that yeah. was because it wasn't bothering the kid next to her. Yeah. So they don't, not, not so many meltdowns, all ha implosion on the inside. Yeah. Yeah, and then and what about asking for help? Didn't happen because that would imply that somebody would actually help you and that you trusted them to help you. Right. Well, and, and in my case, I didn't always know what to ask for. Yeah. I knew I wasn't on the same page with everybody, but and a lot of times I didn't feel like I was behind them either. I felt like I was so far ahead of them. Yeah. I really just shouldn't be there. Right. So I used to use this analogy a lot, and I think it's still true. As a child, I existed at three ages at the same time. I was physically one age, mentally older, and emotionally younger. Yeah. 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 So, so physically one age. Right. Mentally older. Right. Emotionally. And emotionally younger. younger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I would play with kids younger than me because they emotionally met my needs. Right. I would play games and hang out with my parents' friends because they intellectually gave me what I needed. Yeah. But I was forced because of the way schools are structured, to sit in a classroom with other, say, eight-year-olds at the time and have nothing in common with them, either intellectually or emotionally. I'm yeah. just not there because we're physically the same age. Yeah. So what do I ask for? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What kind of help can you ask? Well, uh, the, somebody, somebody's already posted a question. Let me go that. Can either, this is Denise. Hi, Denise. Uh, can either ladies speak about difficulties they may have experienced with learning in school and what support was provided to help them? So we're kind of on that, that theme right now. You talked about an EA. That was wonderful. What is an EA? Uh, educational assistant. Okay. So in Ontario, there are teachers. There are different designations, and EAs are exactly what they sound like. Uh, it's they, important to note here I grew up in the U.S. So yes, Laura's from the States, and Elspeth lives and was raised no, here I didn't in Ontario. Vote for Trump. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't hold it against you. We won't hold it against you. Oh, it's me. There's, there's, for, you know, uh, one of the things that we, we were talking, we've been talking for a few hours now, and one of the things I had to get my head around with my kid was to try to let go of expectations that I didn't even realize I had, but they're just so automatic. So, you know, at, at, at this age, I walked to school by myself. At this age, I learned to skate. At growth this age, timeline. Yeah, yeah, the growth timeline, Gotta exactly. And mm -hmm. and to, to let that go takes a, a fair amount of work, you know, and a fair amount of, um, you know, you have to you have to put your ego aside, right? Well, and, I, and I feel that with you because yeah. I'm not only on the spectrum, I'm a parent, I'm You're a child a on the spectrum, too. and yeah. I'm a teacher. And, and that is, that's actually in a lot of my presentations yeah. is let go of the growth timeline. Yeah. Just because I wasn't ready to go to college at age 18. Yeah. Didn't mean I wasn't ever going to college. Yeah. I just wasn't ready at 18. At 18. I was 27. I'm wondering about, you were girls. Uh, we still obviously, are, right? you're still girls, as far as I know. Uh, so there's, <laughs> there's points in, when girls grow up that social circle is extremely important. Oh, God. Oh, right? What about our social life? You know, what about our social yeah, life? Yeah, it's like extremely it's important. So, you know, the, I'm thinking of that age when all the girls stand in the playground in a circle, and there's very intense conversations happening about this, that, oh, and the no, other no, no. thing. You know what it was in my era? What it was for you? What was it for you? Strawberry shortcake dolls. Strawberry shortcake dolls. And they smelled god awful. Yeah. They were horrible. <laughs> and girls love these little My Little Ponies. Not, yeah. the, not the cool brony re, re uh, surgeons yeah, of it. The no. 1980s, yeah, you know, comb yeah. their hair. They were, they were revolting. They got I'm a little that, older than you. I, I didn't get it. The, 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 the <laughs> that had smell. You know, a girl would come in and she smelled like a fruit basket. It's like, yeah. oh. oh. No, it wouldn't even be a good fruit basket because that stuff was all right. synthetic. Yeah, so and then you go out to the playground no. and you sweat and you come back and you smell like a potpourri basket. It's like, okay, can we stop with the smell? <laughs> no more smell. <laughs> you know, boys smelled one way, dirty. I could handle that. Could I like handle boys. Yeah. They, were, they were easier. Um, but I'm wondering about a, a exclusion. I mean, exclusion that oh we talked gosh. about the other day in the school system. Uh, but when that happened, when that circle 
form. That still happens. It was 12. It still happens. That's started still happens. Yeah. yeah. Started at 12. It started at 12. That's started what I'm thinking 12. of. That 12 year old time when your buddies. Kids are, kids are good up till a certain age and then they outgrow you. So, what are you willing to share a story of that age when you were that age of what it was oh, like yeah. to try to make a friend or did you try? I did and I didn't. Yeah. Um, the elementary school that I went with to, uh, I lovingly refer to as hell. hell. Um, and that's and that's a part of because I lost four teeth there. And yeah. uh, and also, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's, you laugh. You, you laugh cry. now. You lost four teeth. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a okay. long time. It, it adds up. We're really good. Um, yeah. No, it. Um, there wasn't help from the staff. There wasn't help from the kids. The kids didn't want to know. And there was generational hate. So what would happen was you would get the older kids and they would see Elspeth yeah. with her fixations and her oddities and her not knowing what to do socially and trying. Yeah. And of course, giving you enough rope to hang yourself with. Right. And then uh, they, they would graduate. Oh, but they have little brothers and sisters, don't they? Right. And so they pass down they pass down their stories, they pass yes. down their hatred until the little kids, they don't even really understand why they don't like you. But they older just older brothers and sisters yeah. did. So yeah. so what I did at school, um, because we didn't have quiet rooms, so I went and I hid in the bathroom. And uh, one day at recess, a whole bunch of kids decided me and the few friends who were younger than me that I, that I did have, had firecrackers. God knows why. God knows why they decided yeah. we had those. Because they're knows cool. They were bored. Well, yeah. well, they knew For that some. they were. They knew that, that we would that we shouldn't have them. Yeah. Lord knows why we would have them in the first place. Yeah. And so we were swarmed by four, five, six kids, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a group of children grabbing at your clothing, tearing at your clothing, pulling at you, screaming. I mean, sensory hell. It very much was. Yeah. And I mean, you're you're being assaulted. Yeah. You're being assaulted. And uh, you managed to get out of it. The principal's been called over because apparently kids have firecrackers, which they don't. And, you know, when it turns out obviously we didn't, that was the end of it. And so I went back to the bathroom to hide yeah. and cry it out and, and get it out of my system. And my eighth grade teacher stuck her head to the door and said, if you're going to just cry in here, you can get back to class. Were my parents ever called? Nah. Was anything done about it? Nah. You've been assaulted. If you were assaulted in your workplace, you know, you yeah. could, you, there, there's, there's things that happen in schools that if that happened in the workplace, you could like complain to HR. You have someone to complain to. Well, you can call the police. Isn't. <laughs> well, exactly. You could call yeah. the cops. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's nothing. You, so you send kids on the spectrum into schools, you tie their hands behind their backs because you can't, you can't communicate socially, you don't have the skills. You send them in front of a bunch of children who can get away with whatever they want to do because they have the social know-how to weasel their way out of situations that you don't. Right. And if the child with autism fights back, well, that child just punched someone, and now now it's your fault that you reacted poorly. You were assaulted. That's why you reacted poorly. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And and so. Uh, so you, you got, know you felt you often got outmaneuvered. Oh yeah, your classmates will can and will outmaneuver.